Right, today is Art Basics, and I don't mean Anna's brand. I wish I owned her art. Uh, well, I have some of her Art Basics, but um, she, Anna, Anna has um, Finnebear. Finnebear is her, her brand name, and um, she has a line of paints called Art Basics. So I'm not, unfortunately, going to be using those. I'm calling this Art Basics because it's... Um, the beginning of what you need to know in order to get going. So today I've decided I'm going to do what I normally used to do with my students and that is work with circles. Why work with circles to start off with? Well because if you start off trying to paint a vase of flowers, a teddy bear, a, I don't know, a landscape, a person, whatever it is that you've got your heart set on, Without practicing first and learning more about your paint and your mediums, which is what I was talking about yesterday, you can sort of go slightly wrong and then you think, ah, I can't do this. But in actual fact, you can. Most of you who are watching have learned how to drive a car. I always say art is a bit like learning how to drive a car. Because when you start learning how to drive a car, you know nothing and you've got the steering wheel and the brake pedal and the clutch and the accelerator and the gears and there's so much to think about and concentrate on and basically you are manhandling a deadly weapon and slowly but surely at the beginning you have to think about absolutely everything you have to concentrate so hard on steering the car straight while your feet are doing two different things and your hand is changing gears and you're looking for pedestrians and you're looking ahead to see where you're going but after many years of practice you do this without thinking and you go from a to b to the shops to fetch your kid from school to do whatever and you can get there sometimes having gone through traffic lights stopped at stop streets and in all honesty sometimes i wonder was that traffic light really green i'm busy planning my what i'm having for dinner what i have to do after i fetched my son from cricket um, all these kind of things are going through my head while i'm driving i'm no longer concentrating on all those things that at the beginning were so very very hard and I like to use that analogy because, well, in South Africa, most people have to learn to drive because getting from A to B on public transport is not an option. I'm beginning to worry if I can actually still remember how to drive, jokingly, because here in Berlin, we use public transport and I haven't needed it for just over a year. So I haven't driven a car. Not only that, in South Africa, we drive on the left hand side here, they drive on the right hand side, and I'm a bit scared to drive in Berlin traffic they are hectic the drivers on the road they they oh so pushy there's always hooting there's always somebody roaring off from a traffic light but i digress i use that analogy because once you have got to grips with your paints understanding if you're wanting to mix green that you start with your yellow always start with your lightest color if you're looking at this yellow other than obviously white yellow is your lightest color so when you start mixing and making your own colors you need to start with yellow and add the blue until you get the green you want or add the red until you get the orange you want because if you start with your darker color you're going to have to add so much more of your base color until you get to the color you want and i noticed this when i had students wanting to paint something like a teddy bear with a tiny tiny little pink tongue and they were squeeze out a whole lot of red into their palette and then start adding white and they would add white and they would add white and they would add white and they would have like a whole almost 100 mils full of pink and the tongue is this big so if you start with a tiny dollop of white and add even less of red you will have more than enough paint for what you need and not waste so that is my rule of thumb and so working from light to dark when you're working with acrylics and so you need to get to know each brand of paint has more or less pigmentation in it which is what is going to make it hello from Canada Pam 
And Linda. So Linda, this is all basics for you. Um, Linda is a very well established artist in Cape Town and she does the most gorgeous things. But I think, Linda, you work in oil. So this is opposite. Um, you work lean to fat. So when, and I see I've got Sarah in the house. So for me, it's important to to understand your product. So it's all very well to start off and get gung-ho and put your picture in front of you. By the way, I did upload some of my own photographs on my Facebook page. If those of you who are wanting to paint along, you're welcome to use those um, because I don't hold it. Well, it's my copyright, but I'm putting them out there with your with my permission for you guys to paint them. And I'm going to do a sample one today. But so my analogy of learning to drive is you need to learn as much as you can about your products and how they work. So what I normally do is I normally start my students on fabric simply because when you work straight onto a canvas, canvas is primed. So now canvas is fabric. If you ever turn a canvas over, you'll see and feel on this side. It's rough. It feels just like fabric and that is what it is. Just when you feel the other side, it is primed. So it's a bit like PVA that they use on the walls. It's to seal the surfaces and stop your paint from absorbing into the fibers and Yes, so the and to to seal the little holes because if you ever hold fabric up to the light you will see there's um, as it's woven you can see right through and obviously your paint is going to go in there plus the fibers are absorbent so there are some artists like uh, Trechikov actually worked on pure linen if you look at some of his photographs of his flowers and things you can actually see the, the linen texture, the dark linen texture through and some of his portraits where he hasn't finished the, the dresses, you can see the linen that he was working on. And so what I'm going to do is just to protect, I'm going to, this is one of my um, canvas boards, just to protect it, I'm putting a piece of my tear off palette paper on it. And just to make it easier to work on, I'm going to just pop a piece of fabric and this is just calico I got it at my favorite store Ikea excuse the coffee machine in the background yes please <laughs> I wonder if they heard me over that noise I'd love a cup of coffee because today has been shopping day I've been to the shops twice already because I don't have car as I mentioned I have to walk and use a granny trolley and I try and only go shopping once a week so that I'm not out and about in these times. Hi Carmen from Cape Town. Um, yes, so what I try and do is only go shopping once a week. So I've already done a trip to Etika and a trip to Lidl. For those in South Africa, it's like a trip to Woolworths and a trip to Pick and Pay. Um, they were all busy unstocking stocks, so I had to wait while they unloaded a few things right so all I've done is I've just wrapped that around there just to make life a bit easier and I start on fabric for beginners because when you're working on this surface as I explained it is very slippery and so what happens is your brush and your paint want to slip everywhere and it is just more difficult so what I do is I start everybody off with circles and you can draw around anything. I don't expect you to be able to draw circles. Draw hard enough so that you can see it, but not so hard that you, like it makes black rings. Um, because when you're gonna draw on your canvas and things, you want you want your image to be there, but you, you don't want it to shine through your paint because the paints that I use are transparent. Um, so you can draw yourself a couple of circles because there are quite a few colors in the color wheel, of course. Sorry, I didn't get my paints out. Let's pop these next to me here. Um, oh, what was that? A uh, packet. Um, so, I'm going to start. So, yesterday we spoke about the color wheel, which 
is here this is the abbreviation and as I've mentioned today working from light to dark so if I'm going to start with yellow I have a choice I can either go into orange and then red or I can go into green and then blue and that also depends on which yellow I start with so golden yellow is already heading towards oranges uh, uh, permanent yellow is sort of your neutral yellow you can go either way and then lemon yellow is heading towards your greens so if I was given these as an option I would use this as a base and head towards my oranges and reds this as a base and head towards my greens but art being art there are no rules there are rules but there are no rules so if you want to experiment and put green with this and orange with that and see what happens well that's how you learn give it a go try and because how do I know what I know because I've experienced this myself and so many people want to do things perfectly first time round as I mentioned yesterday as adults I don't know why we put all this pressure on ourselves because as kids when we're learning we make mistakes you remember something better if you've made a mistake you learn from it well one hopes one does so I'm going to start with let's start with lemon yellow and oh okay so I'm working I've got a craft sheet here you can work with so craft sheets a bit like a baking sheet in fact this one is a giant baking sheet and it all wipes clean so I'm going to put a little bit of color on my palette which is my desk and I'm going to head towards the greens because I've got um, the lemon yellow going there and you'd be surprised how far paint goes so I'm also going to put some of the cobalt blue which is quite a dirty blue really but it's a blue and I'm going to put a bit of yesterday's cerulean down now cerulean that's Prussian pain cerulean cerulean is a bit like um, the uh, in your in your printer you've got cyan magenta yellow and black so it's a bit like your cyan and so I'm going to start off by painting the edges of my circle and something that I've learned is that when so it doesn't matter if you're right-handed or left-handed the the rule applies and I'm going to use a big brush so you can see what I'm talking about when you are painting with um, the front of your brush I always use the front of my brush towards the line I want to get nice and neat because you can see as I'm doing this these hairs are spreading out and they're kind of uncontrollable and it doesn't matter whether you are working with um, a, a round tipped brush or a flat tipped brush you can still see here that these hairs on the side here are wanting to do their own thing whereas the front of my brush is controllable and this is something that is very important because I often see people struggling trying to get nice crisp edges and they are using the side of their brush in other words that part of their brush around the edges like that and you can't control the splay of the brush obviously you can depending on pressure but as a beginner that is difficult so when you when you are working it is better to use the front of your brush towards whatever it is and as I said it doesn't matter whether it's a great big brush like that or a teeny tiny brush like this the same rule applies and what happens when you obviously you've now painted this side or if you're left-handed you have painted that side you've got that side nice and neat and so now now you've got all of this edge that you still have to paint but you can't get to it so obviously here you hold it like a normal paintbrush now normal paintbrush that would be like most people hold a pen I'm not normal I've never held anything normally I always have two fingers on it it just gives me more support I was told I'd never be able to write my matric finals because I would have bad cramp blah 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 well I did um as I said broke all the rules yay they heard me here comes coffee thank you um ah oh, that's good um so what happens now that you've painted that side and obviously it's going to be wet so if you had to turn your canvas round, depending on how big your object was you're then going to land up with your hand in your paint over here because at the beginning it's obviously easier to be able to rest your hand on your canvas and 
for support because if you have a shake your shake comes from your shoulders so by the time it's got down to your hand it's exacerbated so I tend to waste my hand on my canvas which is another reason why I like acrylics because oils take so long to dry and with me and my great big fist I always have my hands in my paint so when you have painted this side and you now need to paint that side I flip my brush over like that so that I can still see what the front of my brush is doing and I sort of angle my hand like that because sometimes when you're working on a really massive canvas you can't be turning it around like this all the time okay so that's just a little trick that I teach my students and it helps look use it don't use it it's not a rule but it it definitely helps and when I am working with um, acrylics this is a brand new brush oh I didn't have water and where's my water jar in the kitchen okie dokie I'm gonna have to just run there just now but um, when you are working with acrylics they are water based try not to have too much water in your paint because it will dilute the consistency of the paint and you will struggle with blending so what I'm going to do is I'm going to load my brush with a little bit of the yellow and I'm going to start on the edges and I'm going to get my paint right up to that edge there and I see a lot of students are really scared to get right up to that edge they're petrified of going over that line and really there is don't be afraid of the edges okay so now I've done as far as I can like that I'm now going to load my brush and I'm going to tip my brush towards me so that I can see what those edges are doing and for doing these kind of things I like a flat bristled brush um, and it is easier with a stiff bristled brush to do this and I've just got that last little bit so now I've got a whole lot of paint over there I'm just going to get rid of it use that as my palette and grab it over there so now I've got my edges done I can fill in the middle and with acrylics it's much easier to cover your whole surface with your base color in oils you do what's called a grounding where you will pre-cover your whole canvas in a neutral brown um, so that any canvas that is showing through at any stage is not a bright white because what you will notice is that good morning what you will notice when you have finished a painting is if you have any bright white canvas left over um, the the brighter the color the lighter the color the more it attracts your eyes attention the darker the color the the less it will attract your attention and the further away it will feel so it's a good idea even in acrylics to do a base wash and you'll see just now when I do my canvas um, with my photograph that I'm going to be working on I'm going to do my sky and I'm going to do my ground and then I'm going to build on top of it so I don't always cover my whole canvas in the same color so yes in theory I could mix green by putting blue on onto my wet yellow and you'll see because it is so dark I'm gonna just do this as an example it is going to override really really quickly so I'm gonna get that right up to that edge and you can see it's looking really blue and I can pull it back and shade it out fade it out because Acrylics, although they have a drying time of now, still take a little while before they actually dry. And I mean, my flat, we're still in spring. Supposedly, though, if you saw, we had snow the other day. I mean, I went shopping, it was minus two with a feel of minus six. And that was at half past eight in the morning. It is warm now. It's warmed up to four. So yes, I will get green. But I'm not going to get necessarily that green and just for fun I'm going to add some of the cerulean and no I haven't washed my brush because now as you can see most of it has faded out I'm going to put this on this side for you to see the difference in the different blues and this is what I want those of you who've never painted before even if you have to experiment with and see what happens if I take this color and mix it with that color and blend it back I'm getting a very similar color 
but it's a brighter green you probably can't see it on on camera that's a sort of dull green and that is definitely a brighter green I'm going to use a piece of roller towel and just clean my brush because I don't well firstly I don't have water on my desk silly Billy and secondly I don't want water in my brush if I can avoid it now I'm going to try using my green green and shade over here so again I'm just putting it against the edge so you can see that automatically is already so much lighter and if I wanted to start with it lighter I could have even mixed a lighter green so but at the moment I'm just trying to show you what the difference is between using a ready mixed secondary color and obviously if I'd gone for the sap green which is more of an olivey color that is going to give me a completely different look now I didn't have that much paint on my brush but you can see by the time I'm finished that actually it won't be a yellow circle anymore this circle is going to be pretty much green so these colors are incredibly strong they might be translucent but the amount of pigment loading in them is so much so that by the time you finished if you if you had to take a huge amount of green on your brush well then you're going to have a completely green you're not even going to have any shading left um, and I'm just trying to finish this edge as tidily as possible okay so that's just a quick explanation and there's brush hair stuck in there quick explanation of how to use your brush um, just a couple of basics like working from light to dark I could have done the same thing starting with um, yellow and gone into orange and red but what I what I encourage you to do is to get your paints out and experiment and something that I must just also warn you about is um, somebody contacted me yesterday after after my live and said what about these sets that you can buy and so I said well that's all very well and good but I bought more for the container than for the paint I bought a little where is it it's under my desk for when I go out doing um, oh when I go out doing plain air painting or urban sketching they had this rather nice little set with the clipboard and this thing in here and it came with a whole lot of paints well let me tell you that I've never seen such a bizarre selection of colors they're all pastel and silver and yeah so yes by all means buy sets of paints but it is better like I have bought here with the golden opens I've bought um, sets of paints but do yourself a favor and rather just buy um, small tubes of individual colors that yeah that you know will work you can start with if you're on a tight budget your red yellow blue so your cobalt red and normal yellow and then I would add a cerulean or a rose madder or this one which they call deep rose um, and that's a good basic set as well as black and white although I don't use a lot of black um, black has its place and I go through tons of white so I always buy large tubes of white um, this I've got in the blue but um, because I do a lot of uh, sky so I like a lot of blue um, so yeah so that's that's where we at I just want to sort out my water situation um, I don't even have a jar on my desk that I can use. No, that's not going to work. Give me two minutes, chat amongst yourselves, I'll be back. Okay, I had it all ready after washing yesterday's brushes. Hi Craig. Okay, so uh, squeeze out all the excess there. Right, give this a wash. Your paint is water-based. I never have too much water in my water jars because accidents happen and believe me, a little bit of water can go a long way. And then I always have roller towel or a rag. So I've got... Um, old towels old hand towels that instead of chucking them out uh, they come into the art room and have a second life as an art rag 
Okay. Whoops. Oh, silly Billy. Um. Right. So now we are going to do a quick demo. We, me, I. I'm going to do a quick demo. So I'm going to pop that on one side. So normally we would as a class or as a, uh, do a whole lot of circles experimenting with all sorts of different colors and then we would paint the background in because the more edge practice you get the better so obviously doing the inside of each circle you have edge practice and then when you come and do an art um, a background color um, that's more edge practice so i'm just going to pop that on one side right which i've decided that i'm going to paint this aloe now there was an interesting conversation that happened from a lady, I can't remember her name, from New York, who had never seen an aloe. So to us in Africa, these are very normal. Um, this is a, a tree aloe from the Eastern Cape and the flowers on top, we even call them candelabras. So I'm now going to, I, the day that I happen to take this photograph is, um, it was a bit of a miserable gray day, which is quite nice in a photograph. But as I was saying yesterday, just because your photograph has gray sky, doesn't mean you have to have gray sky. So I'm going to change it to a beautiful blue African sky. And I'm going to pop that next to me so that you can see. Try and get some of my clutter out of the way. And right. I, so the other thing you can also use is a sponge. You have to be careful because um, some of the canvases, this one's quite nice and smooth, some of the canvases are really rough and they can tear your sponge apart as you are sponging things in the background. So just be aware of that. I have pre-mixed some, I think this was phthalo blue with some white and no, it's not perfectly mixed, but that'll do. And I'm going to do two thirds of my canvas blue. So I've been doing a couple of these Facebook lives. I don't know if you followed all of them, but those of you who have, this will be a bit of a repeat. But when you are either taking a photograph to paint, sometimes it's not always possible. Sometimes your object has to be front and center, whatever, because that's just where you're standing or it's where you are available to take the photograph from. But even if I'm trying to take my photograph, I take it as I want to paint it. In other words, there's what's called the two thirds rule. And what do I mean by that? Two thirds background, one third, or well, two thirds sky, one third ground. I have my object off to one side, so it's in the one third of the canvas. And it just visually is more appealing. There is nothing wrong with if you like things centered and if you want to paint the centered, that would be absolutely fine. But, and there's a place for that. So a lot of botanical drawings are done perfectly in the middle of a page. And that has its place. And art is so personal. These are my suggestions, but um, do with them what you will. Take it or leave it. So as I said, I'm going to paint my sky, the top third blue. And I know it's a tiny canvas, but we only have so many minutes. And this is where great big varnishing brushes and house brushes come in and you can immediately see that this is a really big thick brush and it's quite stiff and although I haven't mixed my paint properly I have got very definite brush strokes happening in my sky so I might switch to a softer brush just now once I've applied it. And then, as I was also saying yesterday, so I'm going to go down to about there, give or take. Maths has never been, I'm an artist, maths has never been my forte. As I was saying, always, even if you don't plan on leaving it unframed, always just work the sides of your canvas. It just looks more professional because you don't always have the money to frame it and maybe somebody who buys it from you doesn't have the money straight away to frame it but if you paint the sides of your canvas it's just good etiquette and hopefully the person who buys the 
painting from you if you decide you want to sell it or if it's not for yourself will have the money to frame it because framing paintings make such a difference um, so you'll notice I'm going in a few directions I'm just working the paint into the grooves of the canvas and right now I'm, I'm just tickling the canvas very lightly with this brush to try and get an even coverage of paint without the stiff bristles now grabbing paint off again okay if you are working on a very big canvas often they have one of these struts at the back and in the middle and if you push too hard what will happen is the, the the canvas will bow and as your brush goes across it it's going to take off some of you're going to get um, marks so you have to learn to just work very very lightly across your canvas okay so that's my sky i'm not going to do color graduation or anything fancy today today is just basics hi Kone. and so now i'm going to mix myself uh, some of this nice African khaki beige and what I use for that is usually yellow ochre or I use raw sienna and I mix it in with some white so I'm just going to give my brush a wash here right and in this case I'm going to actually use my towel because it's more absorbent to get all the moisture out of my brush and just to clean it off okay so now i'm going to use i don't know why but i always land up working in the tiniest little space i can have this massive desk and in two minutes flat i'm working on top of myself morning Charmaine. okay so now i'm going to mix up some of this so as we were saying earlier working from light to dark and i'm going to use a stiff bristle brush just to grab some paint out Put the blob down over there that should be more than enough for that amount of canvas and i'm going to start off by adding a little bit of ochre and grab a little bit of that and work it in so this is going to give me a very creamy it's not going to be as beige as that which is a good start but I think I'm going to need one of my favorite answers to everything that all my students know raw umber raw umber is the most fabulous color it's great for shadows it's great for all sorts of things and so I'm going to add a little bit of the raw. Oh, my brush is falling apart. I need to glue it again. That's what happens when you leave your brushes in water for too long. The glue releases. So I'm going to grab a little bit more. And now I've gone too dark, but that's fine. Okay, so I'm now going to put this down. Sorry, I'm working at an angle. and don't forget to work around your sides grab some of that and if i was working on an easel i often used to forget to do the bottom because it's of course standing on that and i always had to remember to go back and in some cases i don't remember so i'm just going to do that edge now while i'm talking about it Okie dokie, just get a base of paint on there and get some color going down here. Now, when you are working on a painting, you've got to remember that when you are standing out in the wild, outside, even in your garden, things that are closer to you are big, things that are further away are small. So 
you need to be able to create that same optical illusion in a painting. How does one do that? Well, the brush strokes that are closest to the viewer in the painting are bigger and over there on the horizon where you can't see every blade of grass, it blurs into nothingness even if you have 20-20 vision, you can't see all that detail over there. So over there you can do nice smooth brush strokes in the background. In the foreground here you can use nice big bold textural backgrounds. So this is just now my base that I'm going to work on. Now I am going to, because I then want to put, so I'm creating it kind of how the world was made, the earth and the sky and then starting to put everything on it. So there's a little bit of darker colors in my background over there and I'm going to start texturing them in. That's one reason why I didn't grab and insist on mixing all my paints perfectly over here because I'm going to use my brush to create some of these textures that are happening in the background here. Okay, so I'm going to ignore the fence at this stage. I might or might not put the fence in. That's a decision I will make later. If I want to, where I've got a little bit of blue still shining through over here, I'm just going to put a thicker layer. And to make things recede, you make them slightly darker. So the darker something is, the further back it looks. The lighter something is, the closer it is to you. So I'm just going to kind of smooth out and put some darker color. And in fact, there is some there. I'm just using the picture for reference. And so I'm kind of happy with that in my background. I might want a little bit more of a warmer color in here I'm going to grab some of the yellow ochre on my brush again don't forget to go around the sides I did just now forget to go around the side with this can somebody get the door yes it's a front door sorry um, we have two bells. One is our actual door that's on outside our flat, and then um, we also have a doorbell for the front of the building. So, right now I'm happy with that. I'm going to pop that in some water out of the way, grab my nice new little brush, and I'm going to start building my aloe. No dear, I might have to go and sort that out. So I'm going to have it two thirds over here and I'm going to put it there. Do you need me? Sorry to interrupt, it's the house master. Yeah. There's a big box outside our door. Yes. What is it for? It needs to go in recycling and recycling was full. Oh, I didn't say that. Carrying on. Now I'm putting my aloe in and so the highlight is on this side, the shadow is on that side and those of you who've been following me doing other things you'll know that that suits me just fine because I like to have my shadow on the left hand side. Okay so now that I've got my base in I'm going to use a little bit of Prussian blue for my shadows. There we go. And I'm going to build it down, down this side over there. And I have a shake, especially now that I've been rushing around the building. Um, Okay, too much on there. Grab some more brown. Right. 
So now we've got all of these textures and things going on. So I'm going to start building them over here. So I know I said I need to work from light to dark, but the problem is that now I've got a dirty brush and a dark brush. So I'm going to just build build all this texture on this side while I've got a dirty dark brush and I will clean my brush and I will put the light on the other side. So now I'm just visually creating all this texture that is happening over here and I'm using the Prussian blue for my shadows. And there are quite a few lines happening over here on this side as it's obviously been trimmed because this was on outside of somebody's farm it's on the pavement side or sidewalk not that you can walk there, there's all or plants but for the americans pavement is road in south africa pavement is the sidewalk okay so now i've got that built i'm going to start building in my lighter colors on the side and i'm now just using the side of my brush to create these highlights and these textures that are sticking out and these old leaves that are building up over here. I'm going to go with quite an obvious this creamy color that I created creating little textures and even though this is the highlight side it still needs some shadows so i'm going to bring some of the darker color back in because that's what makes a highlight work is the shadow so if something has sun on it it will have a shadow that's just how it works and in fact because i've now run out no that's too light i need it darker Hi Lisa. So I'm busy working with this painting. Okay, happy with that. Now I'm going to use my sap green for these leaves. They're quite an olivey green. Whoops, that's far too much. A little bit too generous. And I need a little bit more Prussian. and so now i'm going to start building these leaves so i'm going to build the ones that fall down then i'm going to build the ones that grow up and i'm not going to build it absolutely perfect maybe have a little bit of white in here as well and i'm going to so i'm going to use the pressure of my brush i'm going to go press down hard for the fat bit of the leaf and then i'm going to release my brush to have the skinny bit of my leaf like so and I'm gonna have another one and another one these are the ones that are falling down in fact these on this side could even be pure blue and this one can have more shadow right almost ready i'm going to come back with a little bit of green into these on this side and thicken this here and then i'm going to build a few more of lighter ones on this side And a couple of smaller ones over here and it's even got a bit of this yellow ochre color 
in in it. And you just try and build up some layers of leaves. And then there are a few more that come down here. Okay, so now I'm going to build the candelabra and I've just cleaned my brush and I'm using the skinniness of the brush to build the stalks. And there's one that comes out there and there's one that comes out here. Okay, that one is looking more like a leaf, so we'll make this more into a leaf. There we go. Okay, so the candelabra, I'm going to use the lovely heavy body acrylic as a base and I'm working from light to dark. I know I haven't washed my brush, I'm just going to use it as is. And I'm just going to build from the top down the wiggly flower. These are a whole lot of flowers on one stick. Morning Nola. And they again go from skinny to fat. So I'm going to give it a little bit more strength down this side and a little bit more body on that side. And here's my second one. Okie dokie. Right. This one's quite wiggly. It's got a definite wiggle to it. There we go. And this one has a wiggle, starts there, and it comes up here. Okay, so now I'm going to add a slightly deeper color to it. Morning, Pierre. And just add for interest a second color in the flowers because they're quite they, they have a definite glow to them in real life and then of course they have quite a strong shadow and the shadow I'm going to do in the Prussian blue Just close these, pop them on one side. And not washing my brush again, I'm just going to grab some of this color, get some of it off me. And my canvas is now dry. That's what I love about acrylics, is this is now dry enough for me to be able to actually put my hand down. And I'm just using the very, very edge of my brush which I've created into like a chisel shape. I'm going to create the use the tip of my brush to just drop a textured shadow down the side of each flower. Because although it doesn't really look like strong harsh sunlight in that photo because it was a bit of a hazy day there was still a very directional sense of light and that is what is important to help make your picture look realistic is always keeping your sh being aware of your shadows and making them deep enough because I always used to tease my students and say I'm going to put a night light on your desk you you're being afraid of the dark like a kid because I get it that the dark is scary and it's usually the last thing we put into a painting so at this stage you could ruin it by adding too much dark but if it with acrylics you can let it dry and you can still build on top of it okay I'm still wanting to build as I said a little bit more dark down this side of my stem 
and I'm still going to put in now that it's dried a couple more dark textures on this side and a bit more dark there so that I've definitely got my darks going nice and strong and now I'm going to wash this brush hi Jane and I'm going to go back with Oh, that guy's been soaking in water. So I'm going to find what I call my grass brush. It's basically a garage brush. It's a brush that you buy in the hardware department. Um, so brushes don't all have to come from art shops. And I'm just going to put a little bit more of the raw umbo down. Because now I want to start creating what's happening in the front over here. And I'm going to use that with this big brush. And I'm going to grab some of the paint that's already there and I'm going to grab some so I've got a few colors going on my brush here and I'm just going to and it goes against everything your mother ever taught you about how to treat a brush I'm actually skidding the brush up the canvas and remember earlier I said to you that the smaller brush strokes need to be at the back of your landscape and your bigger brush strokes need to be here in the front because visually that is going to give you a sense of scale so I'm using my brush with great big brush strokes here because it was longish grass and then I'm also going to grab a little bit of green and mix it into my because there were a couple of little plants going on in here and don't forget to go around the side of your canvas because that helps to visually finish it off and so even this would have some sort of shadow so where I want you can even see it in here where I want to create a sense of shadow at the bottom of my grassy area I'm gonna just put some shorter Prussian blue areas and then come back come back with some other brush strokes and in fact this all comes right down here so I'm going to so the brighter something is, the more it comes towards you. So although there isn't really bright green there, I'm adding it because that's called artistic license. And I'm making it slightly greener in the front, which is just visually more appealing. And don't forget to go down the bottom of your canvas. So that is my quick demo of how I would copy that picture and I chose a relatively simple one and you'll notice I didn't draw this first because for me I felt that there wasn't enough detail required to draw it first and I'm going to add a couple of wispy now here I'm going to drag up I want a little bit more highlight on this side and grass grows from the bottom up so something as an artist you've got to be a botanist a zoologist an architect because you have to know and understand how everything works in order to be able to paint it so I know people often think artists have an easy job they just play all day well we do but we also have to do an amazing amount of research 
to know and understand what it is that we are painting. Right. I think, having told you to work from dark to light, no, light to dark, I'm now adding some pale on top, but that's because the white is so dense. I'm going to bring a little bit of a highlight down this side of my aloe because I feel it needs a little bit more because without enough highlight it kind of goes dead. So I'm going to just bring it down here and maybe I'll put a couple of highlights in the leaves but I don't want it disappearing into, into my grass. So I'm just going to do that and then put a little bit of like sunlight catching here and there and possibly even I'll use a little bit of this on my aloes on this side just to trick the eye into feeling like there's sunlight and a little bit more texture going on and then I'm done and then it's the hardest part your signature I don't know why we all find we everybody's so scared they're going to ruin their picture with the signature but a signature and preferably a date and if you don't want to put the date on the front I always write the date in the back of my canvas because one forgets one forgets when one does things so there we go done not to worry Deirdre <laughs> you'll catch up later yes so this will be on catch up and you will you will uh, you'll have to chat amongst yourself um, as I had to go and deal with the doorbell and um, the housemeister because we are still dealing with this ongoing leak. Hopefully tomorrow it'll be fixed. But um, yeah, so I hope you guys feel a little bit more confident now that you've watched that and you feel you can give it a go because really learning to drive a car is much harder than learning to do this. I promise. Okay, guys, see you all tomorrow. Bye.